Hi, this is Chris Jeromo. I wrote the movie Above Suspicion, and this is Spoiler Country. In a world of podcasts, one rises in the night to destroy them all. The elder god in an ocean of noise, the Cthulhu of the airwaves, this is Spoiler Country. Hello, welcome to Spoiler Country. Today on the show, we have the fantastic Mr. Chris Coromo. How's it going, sir? Fine, thank you. Thanks for having me. Did I, did I get the name right that time? <laughs> you did. You got it. Well, one out of three isn't so bad. So one question I always like to ask my guests, that's kind of like an initial question, especially the uh, creatives on the show, is talk about their craft. So what is it that you love about writing? And do you remember what inspired you to become a writer? Gosh, that's a great question. I, I, I've been doing this for 35 years and I still really enjoy it every day. I really, I feel like I spent at least a few hours in the flow state every day, by which I mean that state where you like playing basketball and everything's going in, you know, mm. and that's just a wonderful feeling to have. <laughs> I can't remember why I started writing, but I, the, the reason I fell in love with the movies is is because I saw On the Waterfront when I was 12 years Ooh, old, and I yep. just thought that was so fantastic. I wanted to do that. <laughs> then, of course, about a year later, I saw Jimi Hendrix for the first time, mm. and that was it. That was the night that I decided I had to become an artist of some kind. <laughs> so, as you mentioned, being in the flow, for you, what does that mean? What does that feel like? It feels like I could just keep working for an hour or two without even really looking up. You know what I mean? I just feel like I'm going good and I'm all totally involved in what I'm doing. And, and you know, it's really rewarding on that level. You know what I mean? I, I just think it's people who write about happiness talk about being in the flow state a lot, you know, as as an element of happiness. And I think it's if you do something that you love, you know, you're really you're a lucky man. Is, is that something that you can force to happen or does it just either comes to you or doesn't that flow state? Dang, I know that I know this. You can force yourself to work every day, which I do. Mm. And that's where it starts, you know. So yeah. that doesn't mean you're going to have a great day every day or, or feel, you know, fantastic or plugged into the universe or the sources of creation or whatever those are every day but if you can force yourself to work every day is, is that what helps it like is it ne necessary to maintain a schedule a fixed schedule to write well or to find yourself in that moment it's a, a that's the only way i can do it really i mean i remember when i was young i went to harvard and i remember being a student at Harvard and being up at two or three o'clock in the morning writing things. But, you know, now I, I would never do that. I just, <laughs> I don't even roll over and wake up in the middle of the night and make a note, you know, and I work right. from like 6.30 AM to about one o'clock or so. And that's oh, wow. it, you know. <laughs> that is awesome. So I read that both of your parents are, had, are, have a history in the production business, is that correct? They're, they're theatrical producers. Yeah, my dad passed away, but my mom's still alive. And they, they produced about, I don't know, 50 plays off Broadway and in, in London. So what do they tell you about either the nature of Hollywood itself or the nature of being a creative individual? Like, do you, can you remember what advice they gave you on the subject? I don't remember the advice, but I remember seeing, watching my dad all my life, you know, that he would have an idea for something. Or he'd read a play by a young playwright that he liked and he would say, I'm going to do this. And then, you know, a year and a half later, it'd be done. And that's just an amazing process to watch and an amazing way to live. And a wonderful thing to learn is that you can just decide, you know what, I want to do this and and find some other people to do it with you. And, and you know, and within a couple of years, you're making a movie. Fantastic. That must take an, an amazing level of focus to be able to find a goal, pursue that goal, and make it happen. 
I, I would say, yeah, I'm pretty goal oriented. I've always kind of been ambitious on a certain level. Plan A has never worked out. I really wanted <laughs> to be a film director, but plan B is working out fine. But were they supportive of your pursuit of, of, of a career in Hollywood? They were, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 as I said, I went to Harvard and then I taught at Harvard. I taught the first year filmmaking course for three years. And then I came down to New York and started working with my dad and we produced two plays together. And it was during that two or three years that I wrote, you know, I decided I was going to write my way into a chance to direct in Hollywood. And I wrote six screenplays in a row. And the first, the fourth one was called The Miles From Home, which was made into a movie with Richard Gere. And then the sixth one was Mississippi Burning. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I kind of got started. That's how I taught myself to write screenplays. I wrote screenplays in my father's office when I wasn't working with him on the plays we were doing. I mean, your background is, is really amazing. I mean, you're a graduate of Harvard University with a bachelor's in writing and filmmaking. I mean, that's, that's a nice pedigree to have in, in your pocket. It's nice. And you'd be amazed how many people out here are, you know, Ivy League kind of guys, you know what I mean? And women. It's, it's mm. quite amazing how many people in the movie business went to Harvard or Yale or something, you know. It, what did you learn, you think, at Harvard about, write, the, the, about the essence of writing that you would have you wouldn't be able to have gotten through share experience mm -hmm. there's something you think you got there that is something that is unique of getting to that level of university well here's the thing i was in the writing program in the english major and that was a very small and very precious writing program and there were only five kids admitted every year and the great thing about it was that i worked one-on-one -on -one with three writers during my junior year, for instance, I had two real courses and then three directed writing courses with writers who were attached to the university, either permanently or temporarily. And so that was great. But it was more really like watching how writers work and think than anything they specifically told me. You know what I mean? It's just if you want to be an artist, hang around with artists, you know. And so that was a that was a great way to learn was to you know hang around with really articulate artists too you know that's fantastic and I watched some filmmakers there too Alfred Gazzetti was my filmmaking teacher and a great Yugoslav director called uh, Dusan Makabeev came to teach there for one year and so I was his student and and those guys are you know they're really really accomplished and they really work hard and they make a lot of movies and they're really smart. And, and it was just a wonderful way to, I don't know, rub elbows with people who were really doing it. You know, I mean, that's fantastic. Well, they, I and, mean, they, know, they got to do that out here at UC, USC, and UCLA with people who are really doing it in Hollywood. I mean, I was talking to people who are really doing it in other circumstances. I mean, they must have done a good job. I mean, you are an award winning screenwriter and songwriter. I mean, that that's. That's a nice little gamut to run from screenwriting to songwriting. You... It is. It's really nice. My, I, I woke my wife up, you know, about six months after we got together in the middle of the night and I played her a song I'd written for her called Burning Down This Building, a love song written in the persona of, a, of a, someone who burns down buildings regularly. And, uh, <laughs> And she loved it, you know, and she made me put together a band and, you know, get into a writing songwriting group at McCabe's, which is a famous kind of guitar store out here in L.A. And and I ended, you know, she was just so goddamn encouraging. It was amazing. And then I, I ended up, you know, getting nominated for an Emmy for best song for this song I put in the TV show I did with Stephen Bochco. That's the only way I've ever gotten to put a song in a show though, is <laughs> when I was either producing it or directing it. It, is there uh, what what's is the is there a similar skill or is, are they completely different skills songwriting and screenwriting that the the skills that takes to be good at one is it the same as being good at the other type form of writing or is it all universal i think that they're similar in that they're very strict you understand there's there are really tight rules about writing at least a popular song and there are really much tighter rules about writing a good movie than you might think, you know? And I've been learning them for a long time. Shoot, I, I must have been writing screenplays for 15 years before I learned from Ron Howard, walking around in Connecticut with Ron Howard talking about a movie 
that about sequences and how he approached sequ writing sequences. And I had never really learned that. So I've been learning for a long time. And on that level, if you're willing to subject yourself to the formal demands of very strict forms like the screenplay and the song, well then great, you know what I mean? And I really, really wanted to learn how to write songs. So I, you know, and I've listened to a thousand of them, as you know, I saw Jimi Hendrix for the first time when I was 13 and I've yeah. been a rock and roller ever since, you know, so. <laughs> well, if you're gonna, someone's gonna inspire you, Jimi Hendrix is a good one. His, his music is phenomenal. Oh yeah. Yeah. Not he knocked me out. When, when you say, for, for those of us who are obviously are not in, in the business, when you say sequencing, what do you mean? I mean that movies are made up of, for the most part, most good movies are made up of eight or nine or 10 sequences that are about 10 or 11 or 12 minutes long and that make a turn at the end. Okay. So, and I really understood this, for instance, once when I was helping this woman I knew who was trying to get a one woman show together, right? About her experiences as a model when she was very young in Paris. And she had a boyfriend who was a photographer and he, he beat her. And she wanted to do this woman, one woman show about this. And I had to explain to her that here's the thing, even though that's all fascinating, you can't tell the same story over and over. You can't say he beat me, he beat me, he beat me, he beat me, he beat me. He beat me. Because mm. eventually even that will grow old for mm. us. So a sequence in a movie is something like, he beat me, he beat me, he beat me, I shot him. Well, okay, now you're telling me a story. Right, right. And then I ran, I ran, I ran, I met another guy. Okay, now you got, you're hooking me again. Mm. And that's the way the movies work. You, they tell you stories in big chunks that then jerk on your chain again every 10 or 15 minutes and get you back involved in the story and surprise you. So, so, so that's it, really what I learned from Ron. Wow, he's a hell of a teacher too. <laughs> Ron, right. I mean, you, you've you had um, an amazing, I mean, Mystery, Mississippi Burning is, was a, is a very, very, I mean, it, it literally is considered a classic. I don't know about that, but it's had an incredible life on TV. I think it ended up when when the company Ryan that made it fell apart. I think all their movies ended up with Turner. And so it was immediately in the rotation on Turner Classic Movies and and TNT and TBS. And so it must have been on TV 5,000 times since it was made. So And so many more people have seen it on TV than saw it in the movie theaters. It's, it's, it is amazing that it's had such a nice life, and I'm very gratified that it did. Now, when I interview people, actually, I, I do obviously I research them, who they are, what they've done, and when I, when I research you, it really did. So a lot of the elements that surprised, that surprised me the most was your career as, as a songwriter. I mean, obviously, I knew you were a screenwriter. That's is why, which is why we're talking. You, you're a screen, you were a screenwriter for a movie above suspicion that we're going to talk. And I enjoyed it, but also that your songwriter was to me is a surprise. And you wrote the song "I'm Tired" on the album "Heretic." Is that correct? Yeah. And I really love that song. I I I, I listened to it a few days back in pre preparation for the interview, and it's such a wonderful song. And I, I, I'm 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 going to say one thing that's negative to me was that I couldn't find it on iTunes or Spotify or any or and I, and I really really wanted it because I wanted it on my my iPod my um iPad because it's such a great song. It's it's amazing. Fantastic. I'm glad you do so much homework here. Very rare in the uh, in the business. That's fantastic. I like that song, too. We don't play it live currently because I've been working with a trio that's kind of an acoustic trio, a great, great, great young bass player called Chance Onady. And uh, the piano player I've been working with for about 15 years is also my family doctor, David Barron. So we don't play that because that's really a rock song. You need you need a drummer. And the name of that band is G-O-D, which you mean God, but G period O period D. Yeah, that's like kind of group of drunks. You know oh, I, mean? yeah, I wasn't sure because I said it was like God, like, uh, which I was like, wow, that, you know, but it means group of drunks. That's what we that's what funny that I thought that was well, going Here's be. the thing. I've been sober for 22 years, right? Really? And the NAA, you know, they... They they talk a lot about God and I'm I'm not a believer at all. So right, they right, right. give you these acronyms for things you could 
you know, think about instead of God. And one of them is the group of drunks with whom you associate in the meetings at AA and yeah. from whom you learn how to live, you know, sober and whom you, you know, teach how to live sober. You know, we all help each other. So in, that's where that phrase comes from now. Once upon a time, the band was all sober. Everybody in the band was sober. But now, you know, that's not quite true. I, I would say two of us are sober and one is not. But he <laughs> doesn't really drink. He just didn't, you know, right. by my lights, when you say you're sober, that means you used to drink right. uh, or take drugs to excess and you quit. Well, I, that's fascinating. My, for, for my day job, I'm a high school teacher at a therapeutic and recovery school for students. And some of my students are ones who have re are in recovery for drugs and alcohol. That's fantastic. Congratulations. And, oh, thank you so much. And like I said, is it, we're, is it, we, we kind of have in September recovery week where we're celebrating their time as recovered or recovering individuals. And I'll, I'll, talk to, I'll talk about you later, but if you ever want to talk to some kids who probably could use some tips or someone who's successful, they would love to talk to you, I'm sure. <laughs> I'd be happy to do that. Absolutely. I mean, in, in, the, in the, you know, anonymous organization of which I'm a member, I'm not even supposed to say the two letters, I guess, but they, they always say that any sobriety related request, you have to say yes to. So I'm going to say yes, absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to them anytime you want me to. Well, I thank you. I greatly appreciate it. We'll, we'll talk a little bit off, off air about it and, if, if, and let me know if you're, if you can do it. But going back to that song, especially like I said, I'm tired, which like I said, I was listening to it on loop after I heard the first I was and I just got replaying it and one thing I was fascinated by is I mean I was trying to think of a way to describe the feeling of that song which the closest phrase I could come to was an, ex an existential exhaustion that you felt like <laughs> deep inside yourself this just being so tired and you, and you go through a list of things that you're just sick of yeah. and it's so strong and powerful in my opinion that and I couldn't help thinking like what was the headspace you were in that you wrote that? Oh man, you, if you work in Hollywood, <laughs> you know what I mean? You can get so exhausted by the experience. It's so draining sometimes. And the bureaucracy is so stultifying sometimes that that's really where it comes from. I, I wrote and directed this uh, movie for HBO called uh, Citizen X about a Russian serial killer. And a lot of the story turned on the kind of turgid and impossible Russian bureaucracy in the era of the Soviet Union. Mm. And uh, I remember one of the actors, a Romanian actor, came up to me and asked me, how do you know so much about, you know, the bureaucracy of the USSR? And I said, hey, man, I, I work in Hollywood, you know, <laughs> I mean, bureaucracy <laughs> is bureaucracy. And so it, part of it is from that. But, you know, the great thing about First of all, thanks a lot for listening it, to it so intently and for getting the picture, the idea of it. That's really great. The thing about being an amateur singer songwriter, which is what I am, even though I've been I gotten paid to write a couple of songs, but I'm still an amateur. And the, the thing that's great about that is that I can write about strong feelings that aren't just love. You mm. know what I mean? Yeah. I can write about strong feelings that are difficult or bleak or, you know, hopeless or you know, with part, part of the struggle of daily life, you know, so that's, that's great. And that's the difference between what I do as a screenwriter and what I do as a songwriter is really that for, I, I write screenplays often for myself, but often for money. And so that's a totally different job than writing songs, because I never write songs for money, really, I just I've sold a couple after I've written them. But I don't, I don't, I would never write a song for money. I just want to, I want to write a song about a feeling mm. and, and that's, you know, so there's a kind of freedom in that. That's like a vacation from writing screenplays. It, it, do you find yourself that feeling more exposed in your songwriting or than your screenwriting? You know, yes and no. I mean, on a personal level, I'm much more exposed in my songwriting, but there, I always find my way into these movie scripts you know what i mean if you're gonna write a movie script that's good you have to put yourself into it you know you have to throw yourself into it and in some ways you know you find yourself in the strangest ways and you find out things that you didn't don't particularly like you know what i mean let's face it i 
I'm a, I'm a, a bit of a shouter, you know, and, and that's been terrible in my marriage and my, with my kids. But yeah, I wrote this, art, this character in the, t- the uh, war show that I did with Stephen Boschko called Over There was Sergeant Scream. And he was so called because he yelled almost everything he ever said to his <laughs> soldiers. But it was because he loved them and they were right. 18 and 19 and there's no, that the only way to reach them through the miasma of kind of, you know, testosterone that they live in when they're 18, yeah. 19, you got to shout at them if you want them to do anything. <laughs> so I, I find myself in the shows, too, even though I didn't know at the time that I was partly writing about me. You know what I mean? It took yeah. me, me 10 years before I realized, oh, you know what? That's why I did that. <laughs> well, the, I found it interesting when I was researching your songs is that. The last album I, or the most recent album I saw of yours has the last song named Goodbye. Is that because you no longer are going to do any more new songwriting or releasing? Or was that just goodbye to the album? You know, it was really because I had written a song Goodbye because I always wanted to end a show with a song that was called Goodbye. So mm. we, we, I wrote that song and we played it live, you know, 25 times and we always ended the show with it. And it was really fun. So at, when we made that record, we ended the record with it. It's not, you know, I also wrote a song called Thank You, you know, and I, I thought <laughs> we didn't really start playing that live. We've never really played that live. But I always thought that if I ended a show with goodbye and then thank you, that would be fantastic. But, but you're not done then, right? I mean, you're still gonna no, do more. no, I'm not done. I mean, we're about to go into. We've been re, we've only started rehearsing again since you know the kind of pandemic lifted a little bit. Mm. But uh, we're about to go into the studio and make some videos right now. We're gonna make some videos with the acoustic trio, and we so we're not really making an album quite so much as just making videos. I I, I guess I'm moving into the modern world. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I will say as, as as a newfound fan of yours. If you can get Heretic on like iTunes or Spotify, I would greatly appreciate it. So I, I can I can record them and put them on my, on well, my phone. I'll look into that. I mean, you know, I haven't really chased around those outlets, but I should because I just got, you know, the thing about doing the show over there about the war in Iraq was that people still communicate with me about that show regularly. Yeah. They write me le- they write me emails about it. That's cool about their experiences and. And how much they liked the show because it was honest about, you know, what the soldiers went through. And and I just had somebody write me who was deployed in Iraq, I guess, twice, who was pissed off because the song over there wasn't on Spotify. So I guess I finally <laughs> have to do something about it. See, now you're being urged on by somebody else. Get it on That's Spotify. Right. Get it on iTunes. We, we want your, your like I said, your music. I, I just found it. I, I was amazed by how good. The song was it, it, the sound, the lyrics. It, it, it was they were just great music, and I didn't expect it. When I started listening, I was like, "Well, I'll give it a listen because I'm going to interview the guy. I should hear some of the songs." I didn't know I was going to keep looping the songs after <laughs> I heard it the first heard it the first time. So yeah, the, great, uh, the drummer on that record is also fantastic. Don Perry is one of the great rock and roll drummers. He was the drummer for Jethro Tull for 28 years. Oh wow, He's really fantastic. And I've known him since he was 15. That, that's, so that's why. That's thick, as, favor. that's thick as a brick, right? The, the band, right? The uh, band that did that record. Yeah. Right? <laughs> wow. I mean, how did you get in touch with all these people? Well, I've known Doan since he was 15. We kind of grew up together in Manhattan. Doan and and one of, I guess, my best friend, Tony Kniff, was the bass player in a band that Doan was the drummer of and two other guys were in called Scout. It was like the best, you know, kind of high school band in Manhattan at that time. So, and that's how I knew Don. And, and he was already teaching drumming when he was 15. You know what I mean? He would be over at your house and then he'd suddenly say, oh shit, I gotta go teach a lesson. Well, it's, 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 it's just amazing. And you did such a good job. So we're gonna move just a little bit to the screenplay that you wrote for Above Suspicion, which I thought was a fantastically well done. And it's based on a book by Joe Sharkey. Can you tell our listeners your pitch for the movie? What What is it? Above Suspicion is a movie about a part of America that's been left behind, a place where, you know, the big companies came and took all the copper and all the timber and then and all the coal and left. You know, parts of the landscape of eastern Kentucky are so barren, they look like the moon. And in some ways, this is true of the people there, too. And this movie is about a woman called Susan Smith, who's 
you know, who says right away in the beginning of the movie, you strip away everything that's worth a damn, we're what's left. You know, she's <laughs> just, uh, she's a loser. She just didn't get the world the way she wanted it. And when this guy comes into her life, who's an FBI agent and wants her to, you know, inform on the criminals she associates with regularly, it suddenly looks like a way out of Pikeville and Kentucky and the trap that is her life, you know? Well, when you first heard about the story of Mark, well, can you remember the first time you heard about Mark Putnam and Susan Smith? I heard about it when the lady producer, Colleen Camp, asked me if I would read the Joe Sharkey's book and write, this, write a screenplay based on it. And I have to admit that one of the reasons I finally wrote the screenplay was to get her to stop asking. <laughs> one of the most relentless ladies in Hollywood. Yeah. So she's, uh, she's, you know, you really need one, at least somebody like that in a movie project, particularly an independent movie project to get the thing going. You know what I mean? She's just relentless. And uh, Joe Sharkey's book was fantastic. man. It yeah. was just fantastic. He, he spent a year in Kentucky with the people who were really involved in this. Not, not Susan Smith, who had passed away by then, and not Mark Putnam, who had uh, gone off to prison and then started a new life, but everybody else and the, the town and, you know, the sister and, uh, you know, the, the other people associated with Susan Smith. So that's really a treasure trove. Somebody's done that much homework on a story. It's just, it's a smorgasbord that you get to choose from as a writer. So what, what was your way into the story? Like, what was it that you, about the story you were able to connect into and start writing it? I think it was because I was writing about someone who was trapped. You know, I, as I said, I, I've been sober 22 years, but I remember when I was, you know, a drug addict and I couldn't stop taking drugs. You know, I just, it's, it's an amazingly bleak and hopeless time. And, and Susan Smith kind of found herself there, you know, a lot in her, in her life. She was, you know, she had divorced her husband who was a drug dealer, but she didn't have anywhere else to live, but in the, in the house with him. So she was trying to get out of the life of being the wife of a Coke dealer and a drug addict, but she wasn't able to even start. So I think that's really that really spoke to me at a certain level, you know, it really did. Now, and I uh, also, you know, I just really like um, stories about guys with guns and stuff. <laughs> kind of cool. So uh, the, the book by Joe Shark is about 370 pages long, yeah. which, which is, can, which is takes o place over, I think three years, almost if memory serves. And obviously the movie itself is 90 minutes I, no, no 90 it's an hour and 50 minutes i think hour and 50 minutes how did you decide which elements of the, tr of the true story to keep and which to cut or which or alter well you know i i follow my nose in that department you know i kind of i try to figure out what the through line of the story is and i keep the events and moments that kind of stick to the through line and i kind of let the the things that represent a kind of a, a left turn or a right turn too much, you know, I leave those out. So it's, it, that's basically the process. And, and then when there's a director involved, in this case, Philip Noyce was involved, you know, he's always doing the same thing. He's always trying to make sure that the story is moving forwards in such a way that the audience can follow it and get involved with it and then be surprised and, be and stay involved with this new part of the story. And so that's really how you kind of, you kind of make these choices as you go along because some stuff sticks and some doesn't, you know, and some, sometimes you really love a scene that you've written and you realize, you know, it doesn't, it's not part of the story anymore. You know, mm -hmm. you have to cut it because the story is going in a different direction at that point or, you know, that's it's, a, a, it's a complicated process, but it makes a lot of sense to the people who do it. <laughs> that, that, that's going to be hurtful when there's a scene you really love, but you know you got to take it out because it doesn't, it doesn't exist within the movie properly. Yeah, and it, it would just be a kind of a rock in the stream, you know? Mm. And that happens all the time. You know, it's really, it's, it's sad. 
So I try to recycle those scenes you know, <laughs> 10 years later, if I can. Right, right. Now, now, when you were writing the script, did you were you in contact with Joe Sharkey as you were doing it, or or they were they did they exist separately from each other? The, the, the I process? wasn't in contact with him in part because I had everything he had done about it. You know what I mean? In the book, the book is great, and I didn't really want to be influenced particularly about by his opinion about the movie. Now, later on, he kind of took exception to that. He thought I was, you know, kind of being snooty or something <laughs> and we had a little bit of a tip on the phone the first time we spoke but as it turns out we almost immediately became friends and i've actually visited him and his wife in tucson since then so that that worked out fine but at the time i just you know i i i'm not one of those screenwriters who goes out and interviews everybody himself mm. I'm just not the, the screenwriter who reads what the someone else, you know, gathered and organizes that. So I really need somebody like Joe Sharkey on a project, you know. Now, for instance, Mississippi Burning was tough because there wasn't that much about the story written at that time. There was a book called Attack on Terror, the Ku Klux Klan versus the FBI in Mississippi in 1964. And, uh, and that was just about it. Now, since the movie, there's a lot of material about that case. But at the time, there wasn't that much. So it was, that was a tough one. I had to make up more of that story than I had to make yeah. up this story. Well, when, 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 when you're thinking about the screen, the, writing the script, because obviously um, the story is based on real people, and some of which are even still alive to this day. I mean, well, at least Mark is not Kathy or Susan, uh, but, but they're still alive to this day. When you're writing it, is it more important to be true to the events or to the essence of who these people were or are? Neither, I would say. The most important thing to be true to is the story. You know, you want to create an experience using all this material and all these people and all these events that makes a story for that people can attend to and get involved with and feel good and then feel bad about and then feel good about again you know that's what that's what i'm here to do so it's really the story that rules all those questions and if i if i need to screw around a little bit with reality well you know that's why i'll do it when i'll when i do it that's why for instance a lot of the events in above suspicion actually occurred but not all of them occurred exactly in the order in which they're presented, mm. you know, because as I was talking about, about when I was talking about sequences, sometimes when this one, this part of the movie is about, you know, Susan's decline, then all the things associated with her decline are in that part of the movie, even mm. though something may have occurred in reality that was fantastic for her at that time. But that's, then in another part of the movie, when you're trying to take people on the ride of her, you know, ascending fortunes. It's kind of funny that in a very real way, fiction makes more sense than reality. You know what I'm saying? Because like in fiction, you you know, there's a, a sensible trajectory, you know, the character gets better or gets worse at a certain in a certain method. But in reality, people, you know, they're up, they're down, they're forward, back, we take steps forward and backwards, all this other stuff. It's kind of funny that it that fiction is makes more sense to us as viewers than reality actually does sometimes. I think that's absolutely true. That's one of the one of the things that I felt really strongly when I was 12, when I saw On the Waterfront, I thought that movie made more sense than my life. <laughs> that, 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 that really is kind of incredible. And it's amazing how much these the fictional stories do impact us. Oh, I think so. There, there was a great Canadian critic I can't remember his name offhand. It might come to me, but at Harvard when I was there, and I took both the courses that he taught. And he would, he had, first of all, he had all of the history of literature in his head. You know what I mean? He just had yeah. Homer <laughs> in his head and Chaucer and Kafka and Joyce. He knew it all. And he would always talk, he would always like go to the board and draw a quarter of a circle on the board. Yeah. And talk about that part of the circle of human life, you know, like 
from the depths to, you know, return, the return to consciousness and all the imagery that is associated with that and all the stories that have been made about that. And then he would go up and right, draw another part of the circle where it goes from the top down to the side. And he would talk about, you know, the fall of the hero or, you know, the, the tragic fall. And, and by the end of the hour, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have written any words on the board there would just be all these different size circles. That's cool. And it was fantastic. And I would sit there at the end of the hour and go, you know, look at that. That's that. That's what he thinks life is. Yeah. And that's why all this literature makes so much sense to him because it all adheres to these ideas of like the rise and fall of our mm. fortunes. And, and, you know, there are great stories about the sense where you, come back again at the end of this terrible experience of the netherworld. And there are great stories about, you know, princes who uh, become the king and then fall because of some terrible, you know, uh, character flaw. And, and when you're, when you were approaching writing the script of Above Suspicion, did you have that same mindset to the, the way you kind of dealing with, the tragic fall or tragic flaw of your characters? Did you view them? Yeah, I would say it's not as quite as simple as a part of an arc of the circle in the case of a movie, you know, but but it does have that strong feeling of kind of, particularly in this case in Above Suspicion, it has a kind of strong feeling of tragedy, you know, it's as mm. though these two people are trapped in a situation where it's just not going to work out. It's not yeah. going to go the, the way they want it to. It's not. They, they're, they're acting out these, this dance that's just going to go poorly in the end. Now, well, one question I was thinking of, and I, I actually um, had the fortune of interviewing uh, Joe Sharkey yesterday. I'm going to ask the same, same question because I'm curious about your perspective. As someone who, like I said, who's an English teacher in high school, I usually think in terms of things like the climax of the story. And once again, even though it's based on a true story, it feels like the climax in, or the way it's defined is the, way, the point of no turning back. Where at mm -hmm. that point in the story, nothing can, everything is kind of stuck on a trajectory now. You can't go backwards. That's your climax. And it seems like an easy answer would be the death of Susan is the climax where nothing, there's no point in turning back. Do you view that as a climax or do you think there was an earlier moment where you, the, the, the characters reach a point where everything after was inevitable? I would say that the, you picked the right place for the climax, but I think that there's a strong sense of inevitability earlier in the story. Mm. So maybe the definition that you're using for climax is not exactly the same definition that I would use for it. So, because in most tragic stories there, that's that sense of inevitability starts pretty early on. Like for instance, let's go back to on the waterfront. In the beginning of on the waterfront, Terry Malloy takes a pigeon to this guy he knows and says, you know, hey, one of your pigeons came into my roost. Uh, you, you wanna meet me on the roof? I'll give it back to you. And, and of course, waiting for him on the roof are two goons who are going to throw him to his death. Now, Terry Malloy didn't know that that was going to happen to him, but he was part of the setup. And he goes to Johnny Friendly, the mobster, and says, you know, I, you know, I don't feel so good about this. And Johnny explains to him why it had to happen. And he gives him a hard time and says, come on, you'll, you'll be fine. I'll give you a better job in the ship. And, and by the end of that 10 minute sequence, everything in, that follows in the story has to follow the way it does. Mm. You know what <laughs> I mean? He's been used in a setup of, to kill somebody and he didn't want to be used that way. And Johnny Friendly doesn't want to hear it. And it's just going to go the way it's going to go. It's going to go well and poorly at the same time and so i would say that that kind of inevitability that feeling of you know fadedness and, and being unable to escape the forces that you've set in motion arises earlier in the story but i would say that you are you're right about where the climax is now at what point do you think it became inevitable do you think literally the moment mark meets susan everything that it is inevitable that the end of her susan was going to come or do you think there was a point at knowing each other where there was a time to turn, they could turn back. I think if, if they hadn't gotten involved, you know, it wouldn't have been so bad. 
if they hadn't gotten romantically and sexually involved and it wouldn't have been so bad, he might have still really disappointed her. You know what I mean? In yeah. terms of her wish about getting out of there. But if they hadn't gotten involved romantically, I just don't, I don't think, so it's sort of, it takes a long time for them to get involved and, and you can sense that, ooh, maybe you shouldn't do this more. Mm. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe it's a bad idea. I, I I mean, when I'm watching the movie, there's that moment you're just like, "Don't do it. No, yeah. this is not going to go well." Like, I, I, like you know, like the you you can almost hear the the drums of impending doom like just started kicking up. You're like, "Uh oh, <laughs> this is not good." Yeah, and if you know, if you can get an audience to really feel that way, it's just fantastic. I remember when, again, when I was a student at Harvard, I guess they t they brought the first Halloween to show to us. Mm. To show to all the film students at Harvard. And they loved it. They loved it. They were crazy for it. And, and there was one moment when, I don't know, the girl gets up and, you know, leaves the knife on the bed and walks away. And the whole audience yelled, don't leave the knife. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really, if you get, if you know, if you can get people caught up that much, man, you're, you know, you're ringing the bell. Yeah. And like I said, and I think he did a fantastic job. The one part, one thing I found was very interesting is that uh, having read the book about suspicion, I felt like uh, Joe Sharkey definitely focused on the perspective of Mark, while the movie focuses very much on the perspective of Susan. How do you think that change in perspective altered how you approach the story? Oh, I really think it did a lot. I really think it did. And it's a really different story when it's when you look at it from Susan's point of view. And and in a way, my my heart goes out to her, you know, that's really I think that's where the center of the story was to me. And I think to Philip Noyce, too. So and in a way, we you know, I don't, I don't know how much to, you know, spoil for the audience. But the fact that there are two versions of the things that happen at the end mm. is because some people like, for instance, when you talk about Joe's original perspective, some people took kind of Mark's side and believed that it, his story about the way things went and other people, you know, took Susan's and didn't. And so that's one of the very, very interesting and kind of oddly original things in the screenplay. And it was Philip's idea, but I think it really responded to it was a way of responding to the fact that there the two views of these events by these two particular people were so different. It was amazing. That, that, I actually was about to ask you a question on that a little bit later. The idea that there, the, the moment we would say the climax of the story happens is definitely that's the two perspectives. You have Mark's version of what happened, which is obviously a little more jaded, skewer to his perspective. And then you have Susan making a comment about what she says really uh, occurred. And I thought that was really interesting. It, it and I, the part I really did wonder about, and kind of what you brought up, was that it implies that Mark lied. Which, when you read Joe Sharkey's book, it seems taken as um, gospel that what he says actually happened that way. And the movie seems to say, well, no, keep in mind, he's still the killer, and the perspective of his is skewed. Did is that mean that when you were looking thinking about the story, or the director thought about the story, that you felt that maybe Mark wasn't as straight with what he with, with the events? I don't. I don't think I would say that he lied, but I would say that he saw things in a kind of self-serving way and remembered them in a self-serving way. And and but I think that maybe it's possible that Philip kind of thinks he lied. So that may feeling that you have may come from, you know, what the director was doing, because I, I, Philip and I disagreed about some of the some of the elements and towards the end of the story. But that's one of the reasons that we ended up making two versions of it. You know what I mean? So mm. and I don't know. It's not it's hard to say in real life what really happened. It's very hard to say. Now, of course, the movie is narrated by Susan. So we kind of end up believing what she said. Mm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that, I mean, when you've read the book recently, right? right? I haven't read it in many years. Would you say that it's clear in the book that Susan got pregnant by Mark or is it 
possible that she got pregnant by somebody else? You know, that, that's a fantastic question. And when I read it, part of me was leaning towards the fact that it was somebody else because he kept going back to how how she looked. She didn't look five months pregnant. But the, as the movie suggests, that's not that's because of her, I guess it was drug addiction or whatever, that wasn't all that odd. So, but in the book, I've kind of felt very strongly that Susan was bullshit when she said it was Mark's baby because of the, the well, that's time kind table. Of the way I felt, but I think Philip sort of, Philip's heart not only went out to her, but he also believed her. And I did not quite. I, I believe that she was kind of manipulating the situation. And not only that, she had been kind of doing a little hooking by the end. You know what I mean? So that's just. Well, it's it was, it was kind of funny. Like I said, I got to talk to Mr. Sharkey yesterday and I asked him the same question. Do you think that she was really pregnant with his baby? And he said, yes. He said, I believe 100 percent that was his baby and she was fully, really pregnant. And I was surprised because when I ever having read the book, I thought the absolute opposite. I was like, no, yeah, that's I, weird because so did I. I. Yeah, but apparently, according to George Hart, he said he said what he understood of Susan from the stories that she was in a weird way, oddly faithful to Mark. So it was definitely his baby. I was like, I didn't get that at all when I read the book. But damn, okay. <laughs> I don't know how he can say that he was she was faithful to Mark. I thought she was kind of, you know, doing tricks for money by the end with, you know, for drugs. That, that's kind of how I understood, I understood it as well. So it's very interesting how three people, two of them, two of you literally <laughs> involved in the writing of it had totally different perspectives. And me as a reader have, who has read, read and watched both came out with a totally different perspective. <laughs> well, there you go. That's one <laughs> of the reasons we set up the ending the way we did, because there was just this very interesting possibility that what we had been told and what in fact we're being told in the movie is not true and 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 i did feel i one, one part that also changed and I was, I was very curious about having having read the book i felt that mark was being developed as a very sympathetic type character even though he's the killer you almost feel bad of how things play out in the yeah. movie you don't quite have the same sympathies towards mark because of the Susan perspective. When you were writing it, how did that impact you? Would, would you did you think, because Susan's perspective and also as the victim, that sympathy would automatically go towards her from the viewing audience? Or, you know what I'm saying? Like, how, how, how did you set up that dynamic? Well, part of it is what I did, and part of it is just the influence of Amelia Clark on the character. You know what I mean? She's mm. such a great actress and so sympathetic and and she she just has she just looks like w there's something she's been wounded and she needs some mm. help you know what i mean and your heart goes out to her it's one of the things she can really do in the movies you know it's a gift and so she kind of skewed the movie a little bit even more than i already had you know mm. written it as a, kind of her point of view so and it, it i think in the movie it looks a little more like Mark was manipulative than when you hear Mark's version of the story where he's just, you know, doing his job as a an FBI agent. But your job as an FBI agent is to manipulate criminals like Susan Smith, you know? Yeah, and, and I was again, who are criminals. When, when the primary nurse is in the book, I, you kind of get a sense that Mark is just extremely naive. And, and in the movie, you get a sense that it's Susan who is naive. Uh, and understanding that situation. That's interesting. I'm not sure I I thought that that clearly, but I think that's very interesting. But but yeah, but going back to Mila Clark, her performance is outstanding. It, it 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 is. I mean, having been a big fan of Game of Thrones, there's that part of your mind that you're thinking, you know, Daenerys. That's who she is. And, you, and as our audience, you kind of take connect that. But very quickly, you forget completely that who she is. She became Susan. I think almost within a few minutes of her acting, you felt she was this other character. And it was it was absolutely tremendous. When when you were envisioning the character of Susan, how close did she, Amelia come to your vision? And was there ever concern when you first heard that so a British person was gonna to try to play the Appalachian accent and role? Uh, you know, I I don't when I write characters, I have a strong idea about who they are inside and what they what makes them tick, how they talk and what they do. But I don't always have a strong image of how they look. 
So I would say she surprised the heck out of me. You know yeah. what I mean? Because she didn't look like Susan Smith in my mind, but my my image of Susan Smith wasn't terribly clear, you know. And and it felt like jo- you got uh, Jack Houston did kind of look like Mark Putt. <laughs> but <laughs> and, and I was I mean the accent that Amelia Clark used, it I mean to someone who's not from Kentucky, Pikesville, it's to me it just sounded dead on. I mean it it sounded genuine hundred percent. As far as I know, it was. I mean, she worked very, very closely with an accent expert, and that that woman was on the set every day and throughout the movie, and and working with her every day. So, and she was really, really hard working about that. I mean, she really wanted to try to get that right. And of course, it's it's hard. You know, it's hard to do that. It's really hard. And not only that, in a way, some people don't like it anyway, just because it's very, it's a very specific accent. It's not that they're saying she did it poorly. They're just saying, you know, it, that kind of twang is a little off-putting and it sounds weird, you know, to a lot of Americans. It's amazing how how different people sound in America, you know, from right. one section of it to another. But that's kind of funny to have an issue with the accent if, if, if it's genuine. It's like, well, that's how it sounds. You can't make the person sound saying. different. That, or you shouldn't make the person sound different than how the area would sound. It would have been odd if she attempted a Yankee-type New- Northeast accent in for playing a Kentucky person, that wouldn't make any sense, in my opinion. No, but at the same time, for instance, in Citizen X, when I directed that, we kind of really soft pedaled the Russian accents, you know? Okay. The, the, everybody did a slight Russian accent, but it was slight, because if you do a real Russian accent, like a heavy Russian accent, then it just sounds, you know, then people kind of get lost in the accent and they're not, mm. they don't see you. So... You know, the, uh, one point at there are a lot. There's a sliding scale of how much accent you should use in the movies. I think I, I never even thought about that. That's literally something that never even occurred to me. But it, it makes sense what you're saying. I mean, I guess if the accent's too thick, it becomes difficult to understand what's being said. Which obviously, if you're backpedaling trying to figure out what was said, you can't understand the story going forward. And and sometimes even the people who are great at that, like, you know, Meryl Streep, if she does too vivid an accent, accent, you know, you're kind of thinking about how great she's doing with her accent. Oh, and if you're thinking about that, you're not thinking about the mood. That's, that's, that's funny. She's, you're doing so good that it becomes distracting. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. Now, the one other aspect of, of the movie as well, that once again, the people in the movie, a lot of them are still alive. Just like Susan's uh, sister, I think, oh, Shelby, I think was the sister's name and so forth. Were you Have you spoken since to any of the people who exist in the movie in real life? I have not. I, I understand that people from the production did try to reach out to Mark Putnam, you know, to let him know what was happening and what was going to happen and when the movie was going to come out and stuff like that. He, I don't think he really wanted to have too much to do with it. You know, he, he started a new life and, and, and a family and, you know, he spent a disproportionately long amount of time in prison for this crime. And, and I don't think he wants to look back, you know, and I don't think he was wanted the movie to come out really, but you know, he knew he didn't have any control over that. So he just kind of kept, he's just kind of kept his head down, which I, I think sounds perfectly reasonable. I, I would as well. I mean, I guess I'm not sure how, if he had, I'm not sure how you would direct. I mean, do you want people to do well? I mean, it's about a, a kill, a, you know, somebody that you've murdered. I mean, I, I guess in many ways, there's no good reaction to a movie about you killing somebody. You know, you- <laughs> I can't imagine it, you know what I mean? And I, and I, and I hate to, on a personal level, you know, I hate to dredge up everything that happened so long ago but at the same time it's a heck of a story you know yeah i, I mean i think it was a fantastic the other thing i i, I noticed that was interesting is that this and i may be wrong so correct me if i'm wrong but this is the first time i i saw a credit of yours of executive producer is that correct yes it is yeah so Just, the norm i i hate to tell you but a lot of times in the movies they give you an extra credit like that because they didn't give you all the money that you really should have gotten, you know? And oh, really? Uh, That's what happened? <laughs> sometimes it works that way. Like, for instance, if you see a director's name in a box on the ad, yeah, he didn't get paid his full fee. Wait, what? I never heard that before. Was that... What was so it, what... They give you those little boxes. They say, ah, oh, well, you know, we can, we'll try to, you know, make sure your credit pops. 
Oh, I'd never heard that before. That, that's awesome. I never, I literally have never heard that before. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> sure how, how consistently it's true, but I know it, it's sometimes true at the very least. So, so the, ex, the executive producer thing, it was an add-on credit? for you kind of you know i i didn't really do any producing on the show you know I, so i i don't i you know i guess i'm i'm kind of adding to the kind of clutter of of you know producer credits on movies you know in the, in the modern world that there are often 15 producers on yeah. a movie. i mean I, I'm, I was gonna ask you i mean i'm not even sure exactly what an executive producer does i mean what an idea of producing something but as the executive i mean i'm not sure exactly what that position does Indeed. Well, I'll tell you, in television, the executive producer is the boss. And that's a totally different job in a different world. So Dick Wolf was is the executive producer of the S SVU, you know, of uh, Law yeah. and Order. And Stephen Bochco was the executive producer. Stephen Bochco and I were the executive producers of, over there. In the movie business, it's a little bit of a catch-all credit for people who made, you know, substantial contributions to getting the movie made. Gotcha. Yeah. And and I think in my case, it was really just, you know, the work that I did. I mean, I worked on it for seven years, so I guess they, you know, they were doing me a favor. <laughs> well, I think you, you did a great job with that movie. I I, I found it highly entertaining. It, it was it was a pleasure to watch. I mean, I don't know if pleasure is the right word because obviously it's about a murder. So, I mean, but still, I thought it was a, a a fascinating movie. What are you working on next? Well, what can I tell you about that? Everything is kind of secret while it's in the in the works. But yeah, we just got Philip Noyce to meet with a, a movie star. Oh wow last week right they had lunch and they they agreed that to do this project together and they liked each other and everything is hum hunky dory so that i think that is going to be the next show of mine that gets me is so, another philip noise movie quite different it takes place in a different country it's 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 also suspenseful and there's a lot of you know destruction in it but but and I'm really happy to be working with Philip again, although it's hard to work with Philip. You know, he he makes you write every possibility. He really does. He wants yeah. to see what what this would be like. You know, if if you wrote what if you wrote the scene like this, how would it feel? Well, then you got to write it and you end up writing seven different scenes, <laughs> versions of everything. So it's a lot of work. But but he's an outstanding director and a great guy. Really, he's a charmer. So. I know you can't tell me too much about it, but it's not going to stop me from trying. Is this movie also based on true events or is this a complete it fictional It is based work? on true events. Yes, it's based on real events. Is it based on a book that's already out there or is this something uh, it's else? It's not based on a book, although there is a book out there, but it's not based on the book. It's based on what the guy to whom these events occurred told me. And, and I'll give you some more information about it. I shouldn't, but I will. I appreciate it's it. about a combat photographer who went to Syria to photograph the rebels with whom he was in sympathy yeah. in their struggle against Assad and the Russians. But a little subgroup of the rebels kidnapped them and kept them for 81 days. So oh, it's wow. the story of how he, how he got through that and how he got out. So that, that sounds awesome. Do, do, do we have any sense of when it's going to be turned around into filming or? Boy, I don't know. I, but I, you know, the writer gets paid off on the first day of production. Okay. So, the so you get... I am very eager to have that movie, <laughs> have that movie start soon, you know, we'll to see. I don't think it, I don't think it's going to be in the next month or two. I think it's going to be at least probably six months, maybe hmm. more. You know, you never know in these kinds of situations because it's an independent movie. Again, we're making independent movies and so it's uh, really like, you know, you got to push the rock up the hill. It's really hard to do. Well, well, when it's time to start promoting it, I do truly hope you come back and talk to me about it. Ah, I'd love to. Thank it, it was It was a great pleasure talking to you, sir. I, I really enjoyed hearing your insights into writing and songwriting and introducing me to the album Heretic, which I'll be listening to again fairly today. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you so much. Spokerty! And we're back. That's right. We are back. Back in the saddle again. Well, 
I hope you guys really, really enjoyed that as much as we did making it for you. And if you like what you heard and you want to hear more, you got to go check out SpoilerVerse.com because at SpoilerVerse.com, we have a plethora, amazing directors and artists of all walks of life and editors and writers and oh my god are you a lover of comic books like we are and then so there's many. so many amazing people from the comic book world over at spoilerverse.com and i highly implore you to go there and check it out yeah and while you're there you can check out all the other podcasts on our network like Bridges and geekdoms and funny book forensics and haphazard adventures and nerds from the crypt and so many more misery we'll point radio all the time go check all of them out and Check out all of the reviews and previews and articles we have going up every single day for you, every day on Swillivers.com for you to check out, to read, and to love, and to like, and to comment. We have a store link. If you want to help support the site, you can do it two ways. One, go to our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash spoiler country, or go to our store link in the middle of the site there and get a t-shirt, a face mask, a hoodie, something look fly as hell and help support the site when you do that because we get a dollar or two. And, you know, maybe you want to talk to us. If you do, you can do it obviously on all the socials, but... If you go to scpod.us slash discord, you can join our public discord server and come chat with us all day long. I couldn't say it better myself, dude. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You just mouthed out a ton of information at once. And really, <laughs> I hope you guys enjoy what you're hearing because we're, we're working our butts off to bring it to you. We are. We are. I guess there's only one left thing. One left thing? Yeah. I'm going <laughs> to go with it. There's only one left thing left to do. What's that? In an oceans of podcasts, we are Cthulhu. As Cthulhu compels you to Spaghetti. open the mind and read more. Spaghetti.